Do you ever stop to think about all the moments in your life which can feel so fleeting, so insignificant, only for those same moments to later turn out to be moments you'll never forget? When the small grains of sand passing through the hourglass suddenly stop, and something happens that you either can't forget, or you won't be allowed to. In early November 2010, two video game personalities sat down in front of a green screen to record segments for a video that they never actually finished. The pair had a lot of trouble getting in sync and into the rhythm of the shoot, spending much of it flubbing lines and roasting each other over delivery. But then, near the end of filming, something happened. Something unremarkable and yet so significant. The cameraman bumped the tripod, and one of the men made a face. This is the story of that man, and what ultimately became of his life. It's a tale that can be described in many, many ways, but the one thing it surely isn't is poggers. This is the stupidest fucking video I've ever recorded in my entire life. Doesn't it feel good to see that old animated intro again after so long? Before we get into this, I just wanted to really quickly mention that uh, I made a little itsy bitsy tiny mistake and I accidentally purchased 200 plushies of myself. So I've had these 200 plushies just sitting around my apartment for a month and like I've run out of things to do with them. I'm just, I've just been using them to like prop open doors and shit. And so I've decided to start selling these guys on Patreon and I've set up the tier and everything and it's pretty simple. You basically just go to Patreon, you select the tier for the plushie and then I send you a plushie and um, nothing really more complex than that. I just wanted to get the word out that I'm doing that now since I feel like I have seen a few people say that they regret that they didn't end up with one of these. And of course, I also want to stop real quick and remind you guys to go down and hit subscribe. This video is basically like a soft reboot of Fallen Titans to see if people want to see more from this series. And while I'm primarily focused on working on the iCarly project right now, I can see potentially getting a few extra episodes of videos like this out in the meantime if you guys really really want that and show me by hitting subscribe. Anyways, let's get into this. To begin to tell the story of Gutex, we need to understand not his home life or the friends he made along the way, but instead a video game series which he really, really liked. That being... Street Fighter. As I'm sure you're aware, Street Fighter is a Capcom fighter series which first entered arcades in 1987, and had built up quite a competitive scene by the time YouTube came into being. One person who knew that scene rather well was Ryan Gutierrez, aka Gutex, who had spent much of his developing years playing the Street Fighter arcade cabinets, often becoming obsessed with being the best just to prove himself to the other kids at the arcade. In 2003, a Street Fighter tournament was held at Cal Poly, where he went to school at the time, and Ryan was amazed with what he discovered there. He would later recall to the website RedBull.com, There was hundreds and hundreds of people there playing Street Fighter. I knew there was a tournament scene because it was covered now and then in magazines. I didn't know anything like this existed. Over the next five years, Gutex would become an obsessive player in the competitive Street Fighter scene. He's featured partially in the late 2000s documentary, The King of Chinatown, which is mostly about the legendary fighting game player Justin Wong, and his ascension of the Street Fighter competitive ladder. All that matters is how many people you can be. What percentile are you at? Are you at the, are you at the 90th percentile where you can be 90% of the players, or are you at 95, 98, 99? 
In the film, Gutex makes numerous notes about the culture which is built up around the game. And interestingly, when listing other players who are good enough to be worried about, one name that crosses his lips is Mike Ross who he had befriended by this point and apparently respected a lot as a gamer. At this point in time, the core interest in the competitive scene had become that gamers were suddenly gaining the ability to play video games full time. Something that wasn't really a reality before this stage in internet history. Many players joined esports coalitions like Empire Arcadia, the group who built up Justin Wong before he realized that they were essentially swindling money from him. But at the turn of the decade, Mike and Gutex would gain a slightly more forward-thinking means of accomplishing this goal. It was in early 2009 that the pair auditioned together for the sci-fi or siffy reality show WCG Ultimate Gamer. It was there that they were recognized by a representative from Machinima, a video game conglomerate who had been given a pre-release copy of Street Fighter IV. Trying to quickly find a way to make content around it, the representative offered to let them play a copy of the game before release. And of course, two competitive Street Fighter players were not going to turn that offer down. It was here that it seems that Machinima first recorded and then released a video with the pair, which apparently performed well, and the network offered to give the two their own gaming show on YouTube, which they accepted. Now at this point in my research, it felt like there were a couple videos in the history of Gutex that articles would mention, but I couldn't find copies of. I'm going to presume that this is an effect of Machinima wiping the majority of their content off of the internet several years ago. However, most of Gutex videos were featured on his own channel and thus still exist. If you want to hear more about lost media so boring that no one is looking for it, check out Fallen Titans episode 11, where I discuss Machinima in full. The point is that in early 2010, Cross Counter TV was born, a gaming channel where Gutex and his friends were able to connect the Street Fighter competitive community to an audience online, who were often fans looking for advice about Street Fighter 4 and how to be better at it. Mike, where did you come from? I didn't even... Did you look, just get here? Look. You just broke into my look. house? I saw the signal in the sky. I saw that Cody was being played, and I saw the other signal that showed that Cody was being played incorrectly. So I'm here. No! The early channel was made primarily of two different shows. The Excellent Adventures of Gutex and Mike Ross, where the two would play Street Fighter 4 and make a light-hearted commentary, and The Real Adventures of Gutex and Mike Ross, which would feature vlog material covering funny moments in the lives of these pro players. And right off the bat, it's pretty easy to tell why this show was appealing. Gutex's rubbery personality bounced off most people pretty well, and the charisma of these talents behind the scenes made for solid enough vlog content in terms of what was available on YouTube in the early 2010s. One of the first videos they would end up posting was their famous blooper reel, where of course someone would bump the tripod and Gutex would make a face in response. It seems as if this image was briefly a meme within the channel's community, and then expanded to being known on websites like 4chan and, of course, Twitch.com. By the way, if anyone is curious where the name PogChamp comes from, it's a reference to a joke video they did where Mike and Goo play a game of Pogs, and Gook ends up winning by throwing his control pad on top of the pile. This was an ad since they were selling custom control pads at the time. So when you say something is Poggers, you're literally referencing Pogs. Fun fact. Initially, videos on this channel tended to be very small, today only having around 30,000 to 50,000 views, which isn't very impressive considering that these videos are 10 years old. But as we know from earlier Fallen Titans episodes, in 2012 the algorithm was changed to support watch time over view count leading to a rise in Let's Play content. And by 2014, The Excellent Adventures of Gutex and Mike Ross was pulling over 100,000 views an episode. But within another two or three years, their thumbnail designs had become so ugly that they sort of tapered off. I know people aren't expecting that to be the reason they fell, but I personally, I think it kind of is. To be honest, when I was scrolling through the videos of this channel, I was really trying to figure out when they got big, when they blew up, and when they started getting consistent views. And the answer I sort of ended up coming to is that this happened... never? 
It's weird to look back at this show, which I'm calling a fallen titan, only to realize that at its peak, it was a lot smaller than I am right now. Other than the Pog video, the highest viewed videos on this channel sit at just under 700k views, and their flagship show that everyone remembers them for never got past 440. They did other shows on other video games, but those never seemed to get much attention. Their peak was in 2015, when they started pulling around 300k views on some of their videos, and then that was kind of it. I should quickly point out that one of the biggest features of Excellent Adventure was attempts to get people to subscribe to a premium service, where Gutex and other advanced Street Fighter players would attempt to coach you through the game. I have no idea if these videos were good, or if the ploy worked out, but I imagine this was a key piece of revenue considering the game's active community. Another random piece of trivia I should throw in here at the end is that at some point, Mike, Gu, and Justin Wong were, uh, invited to the White House to talk about gamer healthcare. You know, you wanted to be part of this event where we're talking about healthcare for gamers. Goddamn Obama trying to give gamers healthcare. Two main things occurred which seemed to impact their most popular show. The first was Mike Ross. Mike ended up leaving and rejoining the show a few times, playing around with being a Twitch employee before disappearing off the internet. There's a lot of speculation as per what drove him away. One thing that stood out to me was how clearly frustrated he often seemed whenever a gameplay through didn't go his way. No, let, listen, let my, <laughs> To sit down, calm down, calm down. Let's have a serious discussion. This is this is serious talk too. But to be honest, I think that's just how gamers act. Oh! Some people seem to think that Gutex himself drove Mike away from the internet, but from what I've seen, this mostly seems to be a tongue-in-cheek meme when it's brought up, and it mainly just seems like Mike stopped having fun doing YouTube and just quit one day. And if there was something that actually ended their friendship, it seems like that's their business and I really don't care. Many would argue that the biggest thing which killed this show was the release of Street Fighter V on February the 16th, 2016. I haven't clarified this up to this point, but despite running for almost a decade, every episode of Excellent Adventures continued to be dedicated exclusively to Street Fighter IV. And with Street Fighter V, the channel now seemed like an outdated brand, and it clearly became harder for them to keep up with the game or to stay motivated. And eventually, the show just stopped existing, and the channel went from hit and miss to just miss all the time. And with that, outside of his face, Gutex 2 disappeared from the public consciousness. In May 2020, Gutek uploaded a series of short vlogs which gained the attention of many due to his sudden shift in appearance. Now approaching his 40s and losing his hair, he had chosen to shave his head into a mohawk, noting that he had partially done this just to prove to himself that he didn't care about what internet strangers had to say about him. Because I know, I know you motherfuckers will just keep on talking shit until I just say, okay, yeah. I shaved my head. That was one of the reasons why I shaved my head. One of the reasons why I even left it like this. So that I would subject myself purposefully to more, to more random comments on the internet talking shit about me and looking like shit. So that I could get used to, again, I could get used to withstanding that so that I can be stronger. In this video, he discussed his struggles with aging and how he spent over a decade of his life trying to become a professional gamer, while the meaning of that term completely shifted over time. During the quarantine, he had begun streaming remotely online, but I can imagine that he had begun to miss the personal relationships which the Street Fighter community once brought to him. And I have to admit that I really relate to the plight that he describes in this video. Having content fail can be really emotionally taxing, and it's what I feel like I usually have to deal with 80% of the time on this hellhole of a website. And at the end of this video, Gutex pledges to get back into his roots and return to his original goals. I'm, I'm trying to move forward mentally to get back to where I used to be, which is providing value. 
for like-minded people, like-minded FGC people. So would he accomplish this? No. I'll be completely honest with you guys. It's very likely that up to this point in the video, I've missed out on a few fun facts that some of you diehard goot heads might know about. Maybe a mini series or a big crossover, and maybe I've even misquoted a fact here or there. But the reality is that I'm not actually unironically invested in the downfall of the 2009 Street Fighter 4 competitive community, and it's certainly not why I made this video. Because there's a totally different discussion which I think needs to be made about this man and his recent life. Throughout mid-2020, a few odd occurrences started happening around Gutex. That year, during an appearance on a stream, he got into a brief debate on the topic of vaccinations, wherein he implied that he was an anti-vaxxer. So any last topics of Gutex? Uh, you know, I saw you have coronavirus in the background. Do you want to talk about any crazy shit before we get out of here? Crazy shit about the virus. Uh, Bill Gates, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have been pushing this agenda of vaccines for, you know, this entire COVID situation, right? Allegedly, the vaccines have caused issues such as death and sterility, uh, you know, paralysis, stuff like that, right? So they've pushed these vaccines around the world and now are pushing... Uh, you text, you're scaring me, man. Then, on August the 19th, 2020, the mayor of Los Angeles, California, discussed his continued efforts to prevent party culture in the city from spreading the coronavirus any further. Gutex responded with this statement. Prohibition is a dangerous game. Just look at the history of alcohol and cannabis in this country. Driving partying underground will only speed the exodus of many from the formerly beautiful city of LA. It breaks my heart to see my home city deteriorate, but Vegas is promising. This is a very stupid statement, but the true controversy would arrive after another person mocked him for ignoring COVID-19 being a problem, causing him to reply, Did you miss the memo? The pandemic's over. The death rate has fallen considerably and hydrochloroquine has been shown to be effective when used early. Social media platforms are censoring it and mainstream media ignores it. You text, you're scaring me, man. Yes, you are understanding all of that correctly. Gutex is not only an anti-vaxxer, but he practices in COVID denialism. Now, a lot of people have specifically claimed that Gutex believes that COVID-19 is a hoax, and that's basically uh, what it is. Gutex believes that COVID-19 once was real and once was a problem, but that by August 2020, which was five months ago, it essentially was entirely wiped out, was no longer a problem, and was being exaggerated by the mainstream media. He would often try to explain his opinion on the virus through lengthy tweet threads linking to extremely dubious sources. One of his opinions that he continues to spread is that masks actually do not help stop the spread of the virus. In one tweet thread, he links to an article from 2016, and in that same thread, gets mad that the same article was updated last year with information not from 2016. They updated this science article after doing more research. How Orwellian! And as a final note, Gutex believes and continues to insist that the coronavirus can be outright cured by hydrochloroquine. Now, based on articles that I have read, there was initially some belief at the start of the pandemic that hydrochloroquine might be an essential tool in fighting the coronavirus. However, after doing more scientific studies, they discovered that it's the equivalent of injecting people with salt water. Perhaps I'm being a little hyperbolic there, but... The, the short terms of it is that it doesn't help people with coronavirus, and it doesn't hurt people with coronavirus. And it's certainly not some magical cure. And it totally makes sense that Gutex would outright ignore the further studies done on this drug when you remember that he's apparently mad that an article from 2016 was updated with information four years later. In fact, he even wrote his own research paper about COVID-19 and tried to spread it around on Twitter, saying such hilarious things as, 
In case it's not clear, at the top of this thread is me linking to an article I wrote asking for feedback. Is my research peer-reviewed? No! Because it seems like none of my peers will review it! Okay, that is not what peer-reviewed means. Your peers cannot review your academic COVID-19 research paper because you are a fucking Let's Player! I feel like I don't even have to explain how completely irresponsible it is to spread misinformation about the coronavirus to your followers. I feel like it's it's easily proven by this point that not only is it very likely that some of your followers will, will catch the virus, but it will not be surprising if you catch the virus because you end up believing in your own lies. In one of the most extreme examples of this, in 2020, American politician and pizza mogul Herman Cain banked all of his credibility on the idea that the severity of the coronavirus was being over-exaggerated. And he caught the virus and did not survive. But despite this, whoever was in control of his Twitter account continued to use it to insist that the coronavirus was not a serious problem. And it's like, what do you mean? You died! Shortly after all of this drama, Trump himself caught the coronavirus, and the moment he did, Gutex no longer had a problem saying it was real and potentially deadly. But despite this, politicians like Donald Trump and Ted Cruz then used their platforms to continue to imply that the coronavirus was a media hoax, saying that it would stop being reported on the day after election day. And a couple months out, I still read about the coronavirus in the news every single day. But do you know what I don't hear a lot about anymore? Mainstream media is killing their credibility by ignoring the Hunter Biden emails. Ultimately, it does a disservice to the American people to suppress the insane level of corruption that we're dealing with here. Biden make China do something? They have all of the dirt on them. Will the hard drives keep coming? China owns their souls. Compare the C-SPAN stream with the CBS News stream. Increased green saturation on the split screen. But looks fine when Trump is full screen. You did it, Goo. You, you fucking cracked the code. It was the green saturation all along. All of this led up to election day in November, when Gutex obviously immediately bought into the idea that the entire election was rigged, and that Joe Biden had cheated his way to the top. A quick content warning right here. We're about to get into... this week. You know, you know, DC. The thing you clicked on this video to get your brain away from. So if you just can't handle that right now and you don't want to hear about this, then I recommend going to this time code in the video. It's a much better place, I promise you. The mass conspiracy theories regarding voter fraud inevitably led to the 6th of January 2021, when the counting of the Electoral College votes was supposed to take place, officially making Joe Biden the president-elect. That same day, a group of far-right nationalists stormed the Capitol, armed with guns, and somehow more terrifyingly, zip ties. Their intention, it seems, was to take the United States Congress hostage and force them to cease the ratification of votes, an act of domestic terrorism done in the name of overthrowing the United States government. And while all this was happening, I was, I was stuck at home trying to find a way to process it all. And you know, you, 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 your brain goes to weird thoughts, and I suddenly found myself thinking, Oh god, I bet Gutex just tweeted something really fucking stupid. And so I went to his Twitter yet again, and he hadn't tweeted anything. And I was so confident that this was inevitable, that I stayed on the page and I reloaded it every every half an hour. And sure enough, eventually he tweeted literally the worst thing he could have, like he was waiting to figure out what's the worst thing I could tweet about this, and then he did it. So Gutek's response to this whole situation was to throw his weight behind this attempted political coup. 
He called those involved MAGA martyrs and reposted Alex Jones clips to support this. So as a brief piece of context, one of the people who broke into the Capitol building was shot by police. And like, this might seem a little off color, but yes, if you break into the Capitol building and try to overthrow the United States government, they will shoot you. A week ago, I was under the impression that we all knew this. And so in his series of tweets, Gutex refers to this person again as the MAGA martyr and says that they, quote, cannot be allowed to die in vain. Now, there's two ways you can interpret that, in my opinion. Number one is that Gutex believes that the United States government should roll over and submit itself to a terrorist group that just tried to overthrow it just because one of the people died. And number two is that Gutek not only endorses what happened in DC, but he thinks it didn't go far enough and that the other MAGAs need to bound together and repeat this action indicating that he wants more situations like D.C. on January the 6th, 2021, to happen in the near future. This is so horrifyingly monstrous, and it's really difficult to transition away from. It's hard to say that Gutex wants to overthrow the United States government and murder more people for the sake of supporting a conspiracy theory that he read about online. And to then just follow that up by saying, here's another thing I want to talk about. What I realized when I saw all this play out in the exact way that I immediately predicted it would, is that one of two things are going to happen pretty soon. Number one is that this is going to be the new constant in our lives. Bad things are going to continue to happen, and in every single case we'll be able to consistently go to Gutex Twitter and know that he just tweeted the worst thing possible. And number two is that his Twitter will be deactivated, and then no one will ever hear about him ever again. Incidentally, as a direct result of all of this stuff happening, Twitch has elected to remove the PogChamp emoji from their services, essentially deleting his entire legacy from the internet itself. But to clarify in case it wasn't clear, I didn't suddenly start and then magically finish this video because of this single piece of drama. I've been quietly working on this video for a few weeks, and the reason I ultimately wanted to make this video is because of something of a philosophical quandary that really is easier to discuss if we pretend that this latest really, really, really horrible thing just didn't happen. It's not on the table of discussion from this point. So briefly pretending that the worst thing that Gutex has done has been his rampant COVID-19 denialism I have one simple question that I really want to get to the bottom of, and that is, why do I give a shit? That might sound really weird, because obviously everything we've talked about up to this point is serious and worth recognizing. Spreading misinformation about COVID-19 is not only idiotic, it's deadly, and spreading that misinformation to your audience is asking for them to die. But consider what I mean when you look at it from this perspective. Imagine if I had started this video in a completely different way. Imagine if I had appeared on camera and told you that a competitive Street Fighter 4 player from 2009, who at his peak was getting 80,000 views a video, had recently argued that COVID-19 was a hoax and that the election had rampant unchecked fraud. You would have responded, oh, okay and you would have closed the video. And I'm not calling you guys out because I'm in the exact same boat. I had never watched a single Gutex video before I started working on this. And to be honest with you, I don't give a shit about Gutex. I don't care what Gutex thinks or what he says. But the PogChamp guy? Oh, I care what the PogChamp guy has to say. And that's because, in a really weird way, When we start using internet memes this often and in these specific ways, we start to externalize a lot of feelings onto these figures. 
It's the same reason that it was so upsetting when literal neo-Nazis tried, briefly succeeded, and then ultimately failed to appropriate Pepe the Frog. Because even if it's just some goofy MS Paint drawing, we have an instinct to look at him like he's real, and to defend him like he's real. And it's the same reason that I still really like the Dodge Dog. Because the Dodge Dog is an actual dog who is still alive, and she's very old and really sick, but her owner still constantly posts photos of her to Instagram, sharing these happy little moments in the life that they share. And it feels rewarding to know that this meme, which has brought me such wholesome joy, has an equally wholesome story behind it. And I feel validated because of that instant recognition in the feelings behind truth and fiction. And so when we look at this image, this 1 60th of a second from 2010, we visualize it like it's an entirely real person. And when we find out that the actual person behind that face is nothing like the way we imagined them, well, that's not very poggers. You know, people used to say everyone has their 15 minutes of fame, and in early YouTube, that really was the case. Everyone had a viral hit song or a really funny meme video that got shared around every high school in the nation. But now that's not true. Now you only get one frame, one screenshot of fame. And if you don't like that screenshot, tough shit, because it's gonna outlive you. I found myself so often thinking while I was working on this video, like, what is the reason that I am making this? What is my motivation? What do I want to happen as a result of this video coming out? Like, do I want to cancel Gutex? No, because frankly, I don't think he has anything left that I can take away from him. Okay, so do I want to get the word out? Do I want to spread this around to make sure that people don't use the Poggers meme anymore? Well, no, not really. Because the word going around town is that because he's never been able to find a way to monetize it, and because he can't even monetize the original video because it has a copyright song on it, Gutex hates the Poggers meme. So what we should really do is, like, Photoshop face masks onto the meme, and continue to post them everywhere. I guess the single reason I wanted to make this video really was to talk about this weird relationship we now all suddenly have with this random Twitch emote, and how weirdly soul-crushing it is to find out that this funny meme man with a funny meme face thinks that COVID-19 is a hoax and wants to violently overthrow the United States government. Sucks, right? Next time on Fallen Titans. I don't you're you're going to edit this podcast so that Holbes now says... Because <laughs> it means, like, chunky anus to me. It, it can mean anything. That's the beauty. I had people Googling it. Some guy on Facebook's like, I've tried Googling this word. Yeah, it's, I was pretty sure it was just a made-up word, right? It, yeah, it's my, it's my favorite word that I have invented like a child in my womb head <laughs> it sounds good and it sounds good in any situation like Jonathan Holmes I want to tickle your chungus people think I love chungus now I'm getting all these tweets being like hey Jonathan chungus I did some chungus I'm like I don't that's Jim Jim loves that word and he calls me that word but I never I don't remember ever saying, Jim, keep, keep calling me Chungus. That feels good. Thanks for watching this one, guys. A big thanks to all my Patreon supporters. If you guys want to support the channel in any way, I recommend checking my Patreon out. I suspect this video will be demonetized. In fact, I'm not even going to try to monetize it. Additionally, this year, I'm trying to break a thousand Patreons, and I have a special goal where if we pull that off and a little bit more, I'm going to absorb as much Homestuck media as I can and I'm going to make a video about the absolute chaos that that is going to do to my brain. So, you know, every $1, $5 donation gets us one step closer 
to the most painful video in the history of man. If you've joined this channel in the last year or so, you might actually not really understand what Fallen Titans is, and if that's the case, I suggest checking out these two playlists on your screen right now. One of these is in order of release, and one of them is in chronological order, which is a new idea that I actually think I prefer a little bit. And of course, don't forget to hit subscribe, but with that, I've been Quinn Reviews, and that's all you need.